The following video presentation is of me reading out an article that I wrote several years ago called The Care and Training of the Supernatural Horse. And the idea is that this article uh, is going to be read out so that you can hear it if you haven't read it before because it precedes a series that we hope to put on under this name um, of videos and audio, slideshows, etc., that will help to give some ideas for riders who want to get the best for their horse and to make sure that the riding experience is a positive one for them as well as themselves. So this is worth listening to if you're interested so that you understand the basic premise of the whole series. The care and training of the supernatural horse. It's not unusual for people to feel challenged by some of the information we share and the ideas and the concepts that we ask them to consider. We didn't set out with the aim of being inflammatory or controversial, but neither have we ever shied away from speaking the truth as we understand it, because we're committed to the role we seem to have been given. By this I mean helping people to help horses to get some benefit from their interaction with humans and in turn helping horses to help people to benefit from their interaction. The line, balance, helping people, helping horses, sums it up pretty well and can be read in many ways. Some of you will already know of the work we're involved in if you're already a balanced saddle owner or are interested in what we call functional and constructive saddling methods. What you may not be aware of is that the reason Carol Brett and I, the co-founders of the Balance Organisation, got involved in saddles at all, came from our work as horse trainers and teachers of riding. Our specific focus is teaching people to ride their horses in ways that do not cost the horse in terms of his own comfort, safety and health. From observing the way so many horses changed in their natural expressive movement into something that looked restricted and awkward as soon as their saddles were put on, we set about studying the reasons and to look for solutions. In doing so, the Balance Organisation exposed serious flaws in popular and accepted methods of both designing and fitting saddles back in the early 1990s. This important issue basically took over our lives and then became the next main focus for the Balance Organisation for the next 20 years. However, Carol and I have continued to help people with training and riding throughout this time because you can't really separate the two of the biggest ways in which people can unwittingly damage horses, the way they're saddled and the way they're ridden. You can provide a horse with a wonderful saddle that is chosen to support his physical needs and then ride him in a way that cancels out all the benefits. You can ride the horse in an educated, skillful and respectful way, but if the saddle that sits between yourself and the horse is creating discomfort and restriction, the results you'll get will not be good. Pity the poor horses, and there are many who fall into this camp, where they're in saddles that are causing problems and also being ridden in ways that are in direct conflict with the way they need to use their bodies to stay sound, healthy and enthusiastic. It's no wonder that vets and insurance brokers are so busy and making so much money. However, when you can combine supportive, educated and skillful riding with equipment and a saddling approach that is specifically designed to keep out of the way of biomechanically correct movement and support good riding, the results can be wonderful. And this is what we're always aiming for. So in this article, I'm going to be talking more about the training and riding elements of an holistic approach to managing the life of a ridden horse. Of course, there are countless numbers of books, articles, DVDs and YouTube videos providing various opinions on how to best train your horses to carry humans. But how many of them talk about the act of riding from the horse's perspective? In my opinion, at the very least, the enjoyment of the rider should not come at a cost to the horse's comfort, health and soundness. The particular angle that we and I'm speaking of Carol Brett and myself, have come from, is a passion for encouraging, supporting and teaching people to recognise the biomechanics of good movement, 
and by that I mean that it's efficient and safe. Working with the structures and natural function of the horse's body and also the rider's body to enable a mutually beneficial partnership. What we realised many years ago was that what seems to be missing from so many current schools of training horses and from the understanding of so many riders is an appreciation of the impact that the rider has on the physical, psychological and emotional states of the horse as soon as he or she climbs aboard. An understanding of to what degree of damage and potential disease the act of riding unbalanced and therefore biomechanically compromised horses can create until, through correct training, the horse learns how to recover his equilibrium despite the unnatural weight of the rider. Our thoughts about this whole topic crystallised after meeting a particular doctor of osteopathy in 1994. Gavin Schofield has, for many years, specialised in the treatment of horses and made a study of the way their health, soundness and performance is affected by many factors in their lives, but with a particular emphasis on how riding and training techniques impact on the structures, movement and organisation of the equine body. Meeting Gavin Schofield and listening to him speak galvanised our commitment to doing what we can to help more people to understand the importance of good training for the sake of their horses. Unfortunately for many horses, the methods often used to persuade them to carry a rider take them into states of physical and mental health that are at best mediocre and at worst devastating. In an article like this, there is not the space to go into much depth about the whys and wherefores, so my aim here is to stimulate some alternative thinking, discussion and study on this topic. The truth is that when we make the decision to climb onto the back of a horse, we have to accept that the very act of doing so removes him from a natural lifestyle. Is that a bad thing? Well, it depends on the horse, so we can't have fixed rules about it. They're all individuals, and as such, some horses seem to thrive on the challenge of interacting with people, while others very clearly struggle. What is clear, though, is that the minute we subject a horse to the weight of a rider, his life is never going to be the same. It can't be, because the weight of the rider changes his natural biomechanics. Put simply, a young and untrained horse will find himself unbalanced by the rider's weight and that's no matter how light or how talented and experienced the rider is. It's the positioning of where on the horse the rider sits that means that his balance is corrupted in a forwards and downwards manner which instantly overloads all of the structures in his front legs and feet. Most riders will be familiar with the term the horse is on its forehand. His untrained body will adopt and without the help to recover will retain this unnatural posture, which effectively disengages the hindquarters and the hind legs from their job of supporting the dynamic weight of the horse. It relegates them to a role that merely propels him forward. Once this compromised state of balance is achieved, this innocent horse has no understanding of how to recover and this has the inherent potential to cause strain, injury and discomfort unless the rider is willing and able to train him how to recover. In my opinion, any horse that any human being elects to ride has a right to expect a certain level of commitment from that rider to, at the very least, help him, and I mean by that train him, to reorganise his body and movement in such a way as to neutralise the negative impact of the rider's weight. However, in the best examples of training and riding, it is possible to progressively train the horse how to use a combination of his movement, posture, power and fitness to become stronger, more adaptable, better balanced and coordinated than he ever needs to be in a natural life. Of course, what I'm talking about is the original intention of what we now call dressage. Unfortunately, over many centuries of riding, the term has come to represent some of the best, but also some of the very worst examples of horse-human interaction, because the word has become more strongly associated with the training of horses for competition 
rather than its original meaning. It's undeniable that misguided attempts to persuade horses to conform to a particular image seen in the competition dressage arena, with little to no understanding of its purpose, is so often the foundation of bad and destructive training. However, just as potentially destructive are the attempts to ride horses in ways that interfere with them as little as possible in terms of rider influence. I refer to the passive, slightly apologetic way of riding that has become popular in the past few years under the general heading of natural horsemanship or the horrible sight of horses being used to carry complete novice riders on long rides in trekking centres or riding schools. Many people are trying to ride within the guidelines of some misguided fantasy based on the notion that it is kinder, more advanced and more superior for the rider to give the horse as little interference as possible in order to describe the act of riding as natural. So let's get one thing straight. There never has been and never will be any such thing as natural riding. The very term is an oxymoron. Horses have been providing service to people for generation upon generation. And as we become more sophisticated and have more access to data that we, than we've ever had before in our history, it would be wonderful to think that this has led to better lives for our horses. However, our very cleverness seems to have created confusion about what horses need to be healthy in the human world. And many ridden horses seem to be stuck at one extreme end or the other of a gulf of ignorance. At one end of the extreme, we see horses who are trained in harsh, even brutal ways, where they are coerced into bending to the will of the rider through physical punishment, discomfort and psychological fear. Probably as an understandable reaction to this offensive behaviour, we see horses who are uncomfortable, damaged and often confused through being ridden in an apologetic way by riders fearful of doing harm or causing offence. They sit on them, but leave them abandoned like a rudderless ship, adrift, undirected and powerless to find their way back to a state of balance and grace. Although not such an obvious cruelty, I would argue that it is very important that the increasingly popular notion that the kindest way to ride a horse is to be a passive passenger is challenged by those of us who know better. The damage that this kind of passenger riding does to the horse's body, mind and spirit are pervasive and long-reaching. The fact that it is becoming so popular and even promoted as a superior, kinder or more evolved way of interacting with riding horses makes it all the more dangerous. I know as I say this, these words are going to create a similar outcry of indignation and defensiveness has happened when we dare to challenge the way horses are being damaged by saddles. My intention is not to cause offence, but to challenge things that hide the truth. I realise that people who have adopted a passenger style of riding have done so with good intentions and with a consideration for their horse because they don't understand the ramifications. When we're willing to seek out the most reliable source of information about what is safe, kind and supportive for the ridden horse, we have to go back to the simple physical biomechanics for the way the horse's structures have evolved to function within a safe and comfortable range. Riding and training techniques have to use this as a baseline for reference when deciding what is appropriate and what is not. When we train a horse to do what he needs to do to truly carry a rider in balance and without compromise to himself, he will be stronger, healthier, more athletic and more resilient than his wild cousin. In other words, beyond natural, more than his natural state. And this is where the notion of the supernatural horse comes from. In order to achieve this supernatural state of being, he needs the support of having some boundaries set by the rider that don't restrict the range of movement he needs to have in order to use his body efficiently, but do prevent him from getting himself out of balance and off track. In other words, making sure the way is clear for him to make the most beneficial choices 
and making it hard of him to get it wrong. For example, riding with a good rein contact and, hold on to your hats, an appropriate bit that provides communication back and forth between the horse and rider are important and helpful tools. We can all think of times when we've seen a bit used badly, but this does not justify the conclusion that all bits are bad. It's what atta is attached to the bit at the rider's end that makes it either an invaluable tool that helps a horse when used well, or an abusive method of manipulating the horse into a submissive state. Every horse is an individual and has his own needs depending on environment, the work he's asked to do, his personality, etc. What is good for one horse may be a problem for another. And for this reason, we cannot create too many hard and fast rules for riding. However, the rules that we do need to treat as absolute are those that arise when we study the way that the form of the horse's physical structures, by that I mean the joints, the bone shape and density and the angles, and those have been designed by nature to function in their most reliable, efficient, comfortable and safe range. When we're talking about equipment like bits, whips, rugs, saddles and shoes, you can see people dividing into different camps. There are those who have been using all of the above, plus a variety of other gadgets and gizmos on horses with little to no thought about whether they are beneficial to the horse or not. All they know is that the equipment has made it possible to get the horse to go do what is required, and they see no reason to question beyond this. Another camp is reserved for the people who are worried about introducing or submitting the horse to anything that it wouldn't come across in a natural state. Any mention of bits, martingales, saddles with trees inside, metal shoes, whips, spurs, drop nose bands, etc. creates a variety of reactions from mild feelings of unease to downright revulsion and offence. They tend to automatically label all of these things as bad and use this to justify riding without them, often in ways that seem to suggest that in doing so they have a better and kinder attitude. It's not uncommon to see horses being ridden without shoes, without bits, in treeless saddles and looking very unbalanced and compromised in their movement and in their comfort. Which is sad when you consider that their riders are convinced that they're doing their best by avoiding the use of some things that could be a great help to their horse if used in an appropriate way. I feel that what helps the majority of horses lies somewhere between the two camps in, dare I say it, a more balanced area in the middle. Let me give you an example. I've seen horses who've been well shod for over 10 years, leading interesting, healthy and sound lives, turned into lame, miserable shadows of their former selves, because their well-intentioned owners have been persuaded that to nail a metal shoe on any horse in any situation is unkind, will only lead to damage. I can remember situations where horses suffered because their owners had been persuaded that to stable and rug them was unkind and unnatural. The particular individual responsible for this was a vet who spoke and wrote with great authority, which gave her rhetoric more credence than was safe. In their own home environment, weather conditions and the facilities in which their horses were kept, the no stabling and no rugging idea worked well. However, no allowance was made for the fact that many horses are living in conditions that made the lack of man-made forms of shelter and the lack of rugs a real problem and detrimental to their welfare. Even experienced horse owners fell for the sweeping pronouncements that horses should never be confined to stables and should never be restricted by rugs. An example of how insisting on using the habitat of wild horses to determine what is appropriate for every horse that has been domesticated can get them in trouble. It was upsetting to see horses who'd been used to a routine of coming in during the nights through the coldest and wettest days of winter or having a well-fitted rug to supplement their own coat, suddenly finding themselves literally left out in the cold. Far from being happy and healthy, they were often cold, wet, covered in mud fever, rain scald, 
and even ended up with feet that were losing their structural integrity through being waterlogged. Those horse owners who recognised that their horses were miserable and resorted to reintroducing the use of rugs or bringing them into a stable in the worst weather ran the risk of being branded as cruel by others who were desperate to make their horses stick to the regime because they didn't want to even consider that there might be some flaws in it. Forgive me if I sound cynical, but I just find it depressing to see horses unnecessarily experiencing discomfort, ill health and stress. Their plight all the more upsetting when it's a result of their owner's efforts to do what they think is the right thing. So can we agree for the sake of the horse that once we remove him from his natural state by bringing him into a domesticated life and deciding to ride him or to get him pull some sort of cart, we can no longer apply all that we perceive as natural as our only yardstick for good management. We have to let go of the idea that having a natural horse is always the most reliable aim. Rather, once we choose this path of riding and or driving the horse, we have to be willing to learn how to interact with him and to train him to be on natural, to aim to help him to become supernatural. The supernatural horse is one who has become so much more of an athlete, so much more versatile, adaptable and powerful than is ever required of him in nature in order to carry a rider in a way that does not damage his mind, his body and spirit. The interesting thing is that in taking our horses in this direction, in a progressive and constructive way that respects their diverse and individual needs, we take them to a place that can allow them to experience lives that are far healthier and far more interesting than their wild and natural cousins. The very same process creates the potential for humans to develop skills of mental focus, self-discipline, strength, sensitivity, fitness, coordination and balance. So one can say that good horse training is a win-win arrangement which allows horses and the humans to experience mutually beneficial forms of partnership. Let's be rid of this idea that we do the horse little to no harm if we just sit on his back in a passive and undemanding state and that riders who ask their horses to work in a physical organisation not usually seen on the prairie are all bad. It's time to roll up our sleeves and be prepared to make an effort to develop the levels of knowledge, skill, fitness, agility, coordination and feel that are needed by any rider before they can help their horse to carry them efficiently, safely and comfortably. Many of these skills can be and should be learned and practised away from the horse and it's alarming to think about the number of people who use their horse as a piece of exercise equipment. Unfit, flabby and uncoordinated bodies are best kept away from the back of a horse and do less damage when taken to the gym to get into a better state for the horse to be asked to carry. I feel fairly well qualified to make such a statement because after years of spending most of my time behind a desk over the past 10 years, my own state of fitness is nowhere near appropriate to impose on a horse. If I want to ride again, I know that I need to commit to some serious weight loss and some regular physical activity first. So to conclude... As riders and trainers, we have it within our power to diminish everything that makes a horse so special if we don't appreciate the support he needs to thrive when we ask him to cooperate in a domestic environment and submit to being ridden. We also have it within our power to help him to adapt and become confident, powerful, athletic, vibrantly healthy and magnificent in ways that are not needed and not seen in the wild. When this state is the aim, it can make the experience of carrying a rider a positive and life-enhancing experience for the horse, something that surely all of us who love and respect them want to achieve. If some of the things I've said in this article have been of interest and you'd like to know a bit more, then just be aware that we're in the process of creating a series of video clips that we can put on our YouTube channel. Some some of them would be slideshows and videos of examples of how uh, riders and trainers 
can make sure that their influence on the horse is a positive one. And so the whole experience of being ridden gives something back to the horse and creates that wonderful state of being. So look out for those. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and then you'll get um, notif notifications when something new goes on there. Or look out on our Facebook page because I'll put notices on there if there's something new. Okay, thanks.